everybody. Uh, apologies for the late start. Uh, it's um, just keeping tradition of the rest of the event and everyone else is running late and I start on time and cause all sorts of problems. Um, so I think we're going to have a few people walking in as we go. Uh, what I'm going to do is what I'm going to do is talk about the agglomeration model. Um, I'm going to do it at a fairly high level. Uh, I've got a chunk of slides that I'll probably skip over a fair amount of them. Um, and then just get into Q&A because I know some of the people in the room were already familiar with some of this and have specific questions. Uh, others of you, it's going to be new. Uh, but I think if we answer specific questions, we'll probably get to the meat of what's useful for the everyone in the room. Um, quick background, hello. Quick background on myself, um, if you're trying to figure out the accent, I was born in New Zealand, I grew up in the UK, I've been in Asia for 20 years, uh, a bit of a, a mongrel mix. Uh, the New Zealand accent only comes out if I'm drinking or watching rugby, apart from that tin. Um, I've been an entrepreneur for, well, I, my first business was at the age of eight, cleaning cars in the local neighbourhood. Um, my first grown-up business was at the age of 23. Um, I had a recruitment company that was serving uh, IP engineers to telcos at the height of the dot-com boom. Um, very, very uh, successful, lots of fun. Uh, at the age of 22, 23, I thought I was very clever. Um, and then the dot-com bubble burst. And I discovered I wasn't nearly as clever as I thought I was. Um, but uh, that was kind of my first yeah, grown, grown up business. And since then, started, built, bought and sold half a dozen businesses in a range of industries. And then uh, more recently, uh, started working uh, with my business partner on a, a kind of private equity firm, but with a very uh, strong bias towards helping small businesses. And uh, not many private equity firms can say that. Um, so I'll kind of ignore the slides mostly, but um, I wanted to share this with you. And this is actually from a, a good friend of mine, Daniel Creasley at the Dev Group um, that I have done some work with. So they interviewed about 10,000 entrepreneurs around the world. And what they discovered was there's a very predictable entrepreneur journey that people go through. Um, so I know that we've got some people in the room that are in this startup space. Uh, everyone has to go to start up. It's fun, it's exciting, there's a world of opportunity in front of you. Uh, you know that once you've got this business up and running, you'll have more time and more money. Or you'll lose all your time and all your money. Um, but it's kind of, that's the, the initiation, right? 70% of all businesses in the world are in this struggle zone. Uh, so that typically, it's less than about half a million revenue and it's less than four staff. Now, the interesting thing about the struggle zone is you can survive in the struggle zone for years and years and years. You tend to lurch from one contract to another contract. Um, it's not a lot of fun. It's difficult to attract a good team to you. Uh, clients don't really want to work with companies that are that small. But because you can survive, a lot of people actually stay in that kind of perpetuity for a, for a very long time. Um, you, you'll often hear entrepreneurs say that they've been an entrepreneur for 10 years. Uh, and actually what they've done is they've been an entrepreneur for one year and just repeated that year over and over again for 10 years, which is a kind of depressing. Once you get through that, uh, we move into what, what we call a lifestyle business. And if you, especially if you're kind of well known in your industry, you've got the hang of this, it's very possible to create a very nice lifestyle business. Um, now, a lifestyle business, they all tend to follow a fairly uh, similar format. Um, they tend to go somewhere up to around three or four million in revenue. Uh, and they tend to go no more than about 12 staff. Um, now, if you're good at what you do, and you've got a team of 12 staff around you, basically, you can have quite a good time as an entrepreneur. You can work on the projects that you want to work on, you can work three days a week, you can take a month off work and come back and the business is still there. It's quite a nice uh, position to be in. If you want to go beyond that, if you want to get up into the really big, big boys game, 
you have to cross what we call the desert. Now, the desert is really grim. Um, if you ever see entrepreneurs that are looking really pale and drawn and sweaty, and you ask them how they are, and they say, yeah, it's great, business is great. But you know it's not. Um, they're probably in the desert. So some really weird stuff happens to take your business from a few million, 12 staff, up to kind of 20 million and 50 staff. You have to change it significantly. The business model that works here will not work here. You typically have to change your business model two or three times to get across that desert. You have to, in order to win the contracts that you need to get your revenue up to here, you need to start hiring very senior people. These very senior people are very expensive. Um, you have this really weird stuff that happens with teams around here because up to 12, you've kind of got like a little family office type thing. You, um, you, know, you win a contract, you all go out for drinks, you all sit down at the same table, it's all very good. You swear nothing's going to change, it's all going to be fantastic forever. Um, then you hire your 13th, your 14th, your 15th employee. Suddenly you can't sit around one table anymore. Suddenly you start to get some divisions in the, in the organization. People start sleeping with each other and weird stuff like that. Um, and it all kind of gets a bit awkward because what's happening now is you're recruiting staff to get you up to this point. And the people that will get you up to this point are typically not the people that were here. So the new staff coming in are very impressed with what you've built, but they cannot believe you managed to build it with the idiots that you started with. The idiots that you started with who worked sweating blood and tears for you are getting really annoyed with these new people who think they know everything. And they're getting really annoyed with you because they used to be able to go and have a coffee with you and talk about their career. Now they have to book your time through a PA. Um, so you get all sorts of weird stuff going on. Um, you'll find a lot of entrepreneurs in this space spend a lot of time caught up in stupid legal battles. Uh, so for example, one quite common thing is if an employee leaves from here, you bake them a cake, you wish them well, you write them a nice reference, it's all very nice. If an employee leaves here, there's a good chance they're going to sue you for wrongful dismissal because they think they'll make more money from doing that than by looking for a new job. So you get caught into a whole bunch of really weird and frustrating things with entrepreneurs. Now, before you give up entrepreneurship, um, you can get out the other side. And if you get out the other side, typically if you get kind of above 50 employees, you're now at a point where you've got enough grown-ups in the company that the business should be able to run without you. Um, it starts to scale. A couple of things happen. Your profitability typically starts to take off at that point because you've now got the systems and the processes in place. More importantly for today's conversations, your valuations tend to go up significantly. Lifestyle businesses are great, but they can attract very low valuations because they're very much dependent on you. Companies in the desert, bigger companies that might buy you are acutely aware that you've still got a lot of problems you're trying to sort out. When you get into this space, you become a threat or an opportunity to that 1% of companies here, and therefore your valuations rise because it's easier for them to acquire you than to try to find you. So you start to get into a dominant position. Now the reason why I really like this, this slide, and uh, although the, the revenue figures can kind of change based on different areas, and if you're in the Philippines, then you can kind of triple all these staff numbers, but generally speaking, it's a fairly similar pattern throughout the world. Um, what I find interesting is when you see what serial entrepreneurs do, successful serial entrepreneurs. Successful serial entrepreneurs never do this thing. Right? They're never going to go and start a business on their own once they've been successful before because they know it's too hard to figure this stuff out on your own. It's just too hard. They will always start with a team, so they might have funding already or they'll have partners, but they're never going to try and figure it out here on their own. Many successful serial entrepreneurs stop in lifestyle. They've figured out that actually it's quite a nice place, place to be. But the ones that go across here, decide to go across there as quickly as possible. Nobody wants to do it organically twice. Um, so they'll either raise a ton of financing and go across that way, or they'll start doing acquisitions to try and get across it in a faster way. Um, and what we're going to be talking about today is that second model. It's about creating acquisitions to allow you to get uh, to scale your business. 
Um, so I guess to give you uh, let's do a, a quick bit about um, I guess the macro environment for entrepreneurs. Now when I'm I guess to give you a bit of context for this, uh, having been an entrepreneur for 20 years um, and I've written a couple of books on entrepreneurship. Uh, I run a I have a media partnership that's allowed me to interview six or seven hundred entrepreneurs. Um, so just by virtue of doing those things, you tend to end up with a fairly significant network of, of uh, successful entrepreneurs. Now myself and my business partner Jeremy, and Jeremy Harvard teaches uh, small business M&A, um, so consequently he had quite a big network of small business owners. Within our network, we had a lot of what you would perceive as successful entrepreneurs. They were doing 5, 10, 20 million in revenue, and to the outside world, they looked very successful. Uh, but we knew them. We used to go out drinking with them, meet with them, um, and these uh, men and women that were running these companies were often just as stressed and, and pulled thin as companies that were right at the beginning of the, the process. Um, and it just seemed nuts to us that you could be so successful on the outside, but actually your business was really, really struggling and found themselves really struggling with what they'd created. Um, now what happens when you kind of get under that duress for that length of time is that you start looking for, for options to get out of it. Um, and so generally, if you've built a business that's 5, 10, 20 million big, uh, you start looking at, well, how can I, um, how can I find an exit to work for, for this? And there's a couple of things that, that start to become very apparent. And I don't know which panel discussion it was in here yesterday, but one of the, the topics that was coming up was um, how small businesses can't compete for big contracts. And so the, the first problem that we saw is something that we call the scale paradox. So when you're a successful small business, you're still a small business and you face this scale, scale paradox. You're too small to go for the really big contracts and because you can't get the really big contracts, you remain small. Um, you desperately need good staff to go across that, that desert and beyond. The problem is the really good staff don't want to take a risk on a small business. It's too risky. Um, and because you can't get a really good staff, you can't develop the, the, the way in. So that scale paradox becomes really, really frustrating. Um, and actually, just to, on that first point around winning contracts, it's actually procurement best practice within corporates never to give you a contract that's more than a third of your annual revenue. Uh, so you can pitch for these, these projects, and yours might be the best best pitch out there, it could be half the price of your competitor, you could have the best team, and you still won't win that contract because there's an employee on the other side who knows that their career is at risk if they give you that contract and you drop it. Whereas if they give it to a PLC, they're safe, their job is safe. And so what happens is they'll give that contract to a PLC, the PLC will outsource the work to you because you're better at delivering it, but they'll cream off all the profits in, in the process. So the scale paradox gets really, really frustrating. Um, the second thing that frustrates entrepreneurs when you've kind of built a five, 10, 20 million dollar business is that everyone else seems to be making money out of your business but you. Yeah, if you've built a business like that, you've got you know, a couple of hundred staff that are all taking home nice checks at the end of the month. You've got a whole ecosystem of suppliers and partners and landlords that all extract money from you every single month. Yet you as the founder and the, the majority owner, it's very, very difficult to take much money off the table. So you can pay yourself a nice salary, but you're never going to get money. You can't pull chunks and chunks of cash out of the business. Um, and it gets really frustrating that everyone else is making money but you. And then you have a cash squeeze where you have to remortgage your house to pay the staff. And you just go, what on earth am I doing? Why have I created so much value for so many people and yet I'm still not getting anything out of this. Um, and those two problems tend to compound on each other and what happens is you start looking for a, a, an exit or a way out of that problem and that creates the third problem. So if you start looking for an exit, most entrepreneurs, especially in the startup space, 
have this idealized view that you're going to build a business and in three to five years you're going to sell it for billions and go and lie on the beach and it's going to be, it's going to be nuts. Um, it just doesn't work like that. And, and as you start to go up the ladder, you realize <coughs> that nobody's going to pay you money and, and let you walk away. It just doesn't work like that. Uh, so, or if they do, they're going to pay you a fraction of, of what your business is worth. So the most typical exit for entrepreneurs is to sell themselves to a bigger competitor. Um, and actually, I'm doing a fireside chat with uh, Paul from Turk Telecom today, who's acquired a number of companies. Um, um, we'll be tormenting him about how they, how they do that. Um, but typically, the way that works is the entrepreneur gets put on a three-year or a five-year earn. Now, that's all good in, in principle, and uh, I've, I've been for many uh, bottles of champagne with entrepreneurs that have just sold their business, it's the best deal ever, and we're drinking lots of champagne, and it's all very good. Um, but invariably, I'm back in the pub with them six months later, and they're drowning their sorrows because they've been fired from their own company, or they've quit their own company, um, and they've left the majority of that deal on the table. Because entrepreneurs make terrible employees. Um, and by the way, if you've got to a point where you're thinking about selling your business, that's really the worst time to be signing up to work in that business for the next three to five years. Now, big companies know this. Uh, WPP, which is one of the, uh, is the biggest marketing group in the world, uh, they've done something like 1,800 acquisitions in the last 30 years. They're very, very good at this. And, and I had a meeting with uh, a social encounter with one of their head of MMAs, and he was incredibly open with me about their model, but it, it came as a real slap in the face for me, because it was an eye opener. So I asked about the model, and they said, well, it's very simple. If you're doing a million dollars in profit, we'll probably offer you six or seven million based on you hitting targets over the next three to five years. Internally, we'll write it down as two to two and a half million that we expect to pay. So they offer you six or seven million, they're not expecting to pay anything more than two or two and a half million. They're so <coughs> confident that you're not going to hit your targets. And they've got the data to back it up. Um, that that's, that's the model they play. Now that works very well for them because they end up with your client base and your business, uh, but it doesn't cost them a fraction of what the deal is worth. Now the reason that this happens is it doesn't matter how sweet they were to you in negotiations, the day you go and sit in their office on the, on the first day, their lawyer and their accountant will come up to you and say, hey, look, congratulations, it's a fantastic business that you've built. Um, it's a bit shit, though, so we need to change it. Uh, your brand's rubbish, our brand's really good, so can you rebrand everything? Uh, and by the way, see why you've got so many clients, your, your corporate contracts are terrible. You need to go and renegotiate all your corporate contracts. Uh, and that staff base that's so loyal because you let them work from wherever they want to work, <coughs> we don't do that. So you need to change their contracts, they need to be in the office at 8 o'clock. Um, and suddenly, as an entrepreneur, you're committed to all of these goals that you're going to hit, and they're tying an arm behind your back and saying, you've got to do it this way. Your staff now hate you because you promised them nothing was going to change. Uh, um, and your clients are starting to hate you as well because everything is uh, changed. So it's a pretty miserable outlook, but before uh, you kind of, kind of slash your wrists, um, there, there, there is an alternative. But um, this was the situation that myself and Jeremy were looking at within our peers, and we're going, the media right now is portraying entrepreneurship as being really cool, and startups are cool, and we're the new rock stars, and it's all really cool. Um, yet the reality is, so few entrepreneurs are actually getting ahead of the game that it's really disturbing. And what's happened in the last 20 years since I've been uh, playing this silly game is that employee uh, salaries, especially at the top level, have shot through the roof. Uh, if you're now at senior management and director level, uh, it's not unheard of. It's, it's, it's fairly common now to be earning a million and a million plus salaries. That just didn't used to exist 20 years ago. The only way you started to get to that money was to own your own business. So it's now starting to look really unappealing if you peel back the, the layers. Um, so we basically got very frustrated with, with that scenario. Uh, my business partner, Jeremy, said, look, there's got to be a, a smart way of doing this. And he had actually 
sold two companies, he bought two companies and sold them to a bigger player, uh, and exactly those things have happened. The founders have ended up leaving in disgust and leaving a lot of money on the, the table. So there's got to be a better way. So the model that we um, move to, and I'm kind of jumping around the slides, but. Uh, okay, the model that we arrived at, we call the agglomeration model. And basically, the idea is we create a publicly listed vehicle exclusively for the use of good entrepreneurs. And what happens is we find these good businesses, they're debt free, they're profitable, they're well run, uh, just as all the businesses in our, our network were, and they swap their private stock for public stock, but they carry on running the business exactly the same as before. So contractually, no one can tell them how to run their business. Our genuine belief is the best people who run the businesses are the founders and the entrepreneurs that set them up. Uh, so what happens is this solves those problems. Because first of all, you no longer have the scale paradox. When you go and pitch for business, you're a $200 million global PLC, not a $10 million local business. Um, when you are trying to attract senior staff to come and work with you, you can incentivize them with real tangible stock. If, if anyone's ever been a startup and tried to persuade people to come and work for them to stock, um, it's easy to get new people to do that. It's very difficult to get anyone senior to do that because they know that it's very limited the chances of getting back. But public stock is very tangible. Um, most of the companies that we're dealing with got to a point where they realized that actually acquisition is probably now the best way for them to grow. Uh, a lot of the top companies grow year on year through an acquisition. Most small businesses, by the time they've got to 10 or 15 million, they also understand that they could grow much faster if they were acquiring other companies. Yet the perception is that that's hugely expensive and difficult and you need a team of lawyers and a team of accountants. Um, Yet when they join a public company like this, you suddenly have a currency which enables you to go out and start to do these acquisitions. And it's much, much easier to do that with public stock than it is with, with private stock. So it solves that problem, it solves those two problems, and then you've got the value creation piece for the entrepreneur, because the entrepreneur now has liquid stock. So for the first time in their life, they can actually sell 5% of the company and pay down the, the mortgage buy the car, do all of the things that they've been promising their partner that they were going to do for years, um, they have that, that liquidity. So it becomes really interesting again. And one of the problems that entrepreneurs have is when we plateau in business, we all tend to have a very short attention span. And plateauing for us in business is kind of like going backwards. And so what you often find is entrepreneurs will get to a certain level and then they just start messing around. They'll lose interest in their core business because it's no longer scaling at the same time. So they'll start little ventures on the side and they'll do anything to keep themselves amused. Um, what we've found is a lot of entrepreneurs, by the time they talk to us, they're really fed up with the business because it's not moving. But the chance to be in a PLC and playing the PLC game and going out and doing acquisitions uh, becomes really, really attractive. And suddenly they're kind of uh, lit up again about their, their business. Um, by virtue of the fact that they they tend to have been in their industry for 10, 15 uh, or more years, they know the other players, they know the ones they like and trust, they know the ones that would be good acquisitions. They've probably been thinking about it for three or four years, they just haven't been able to do it. So it solves uh, a lot of problems for them. Uh, that. Um, yeah, it really... Uh, it really was, again, designed for our network, but it, it's clearly crossed beyond that. Um, it also addresses some bigger problems that are uh, being faced at the moment. So, in most countries, I know we've got a few people from, from different countries, we've got a younger population, but in most developed countries, uh, we're all facing this dem demographic cliff. Um, this is a really, really big problem. Uh, in the US, and, and this is the same for US, Australia, Europe, um, uh, the, the stats are generally better in the US. In the US, 75% of all small businesses are owned by baby boomers. Now, baby boomers are all about to turn 70 in the next few years. Uh, 
when they started their business 20, 30 years ago, their idea was that they were going to sell it about now and they were going to retire with millions. Um, but what they're finding is that all of their competitors and all of their suppliers and all of their downstream and everyone in the ecosystem is also a baby boomer who wants to sell their business. So suddenly what's happened is you've got a flood of small businesses that are on the market. Um, now, basic laws of economics, everyone's selling at the same time, the value of everything drops down. In the US last year, 26,000 small businesses sold. The average price paid was 1.25 times net profit. That's really bad. Can you imagine working 20 years of your life? You've got a business that's spinning up a million dollars in profit and someone offers you one and a quarter million to take over your business. I spoke to a garage owner in Brisbane, Australia, who had been offered one time. He had a 20 year old business, three garages, fixing cars, great brand, great client base, great staff. Uh, the best offer he'd been made was one times profit to exit. And he's like, there's no point. I might as well just wind the business down over the next year and all the build it down. The only reason he won't do that is because he, he feels responsible for his staff. Uh, so this is a really, really dire situation. Um, on the flip side of that, it used to be, BNP Paribas did a fantastic survey of 11,000 high net worths on how they made their money. And they were trying to figure out what the commonalities were. Um, and the, the one commonality that came through was that people came into money, they bought a business and they grew that business. And BNP Paribas basically, their synopsis of the report was that if you want to create wealth, you buy an existing business and you grow. Uh, now the problem is, nobody's buying businesses anymore because it's so cheap and easy and cool and trendy to start a startup that it's actually perceived as more risky to buy something that's, that's solid and got kind of customers and all that sort of stuff. Um, which is kind of a bonkers way of looking at it, but unfortunately that's what's happening. So we were very acutely aware of that when we were coming up with this model. And, um, our model is, is, I guess, a side effect of our model is that it solves this problem. So succession planning for entrepreneurs is really, really difficult. Uh, it's nearly impossible for an entrepreneur to bring in someone from the outside, but it's a good cultural fit to take the business over. Uh, it's nearly impossible to train an employee to think like a founder. It's possible, but it's nearly impossible. So what do you do when you actually want to retire? Well, the only model we have found that can consistently beats the average is to find an entrepreneur like you, running a business like yours, acquire that business, and put the entrepreneur in charge of both businesses. Then at least you end up with an entrepreneurial mind running, running the business. Now, in the agglomeration model, what you have is over the next two or three years, in any one of these PLCs, we should be hitting to 300 companies within the group. Um, now within that group, you're bound to have entrepreneurs that would be interested in taking over the running of your business. In fact, what we're starting to see is entrepreneurs coming to the agglomeration model specifically with the idea of rolling up as many of their um, baby boomer competitors as possible because they know that they can bring them in uh, it gets them a good price, they get the, the public shares which they can sell, but then the, the younger entrepreneur can start to rebrand everything and do all the typical stuff. Um, so this is just it's one of the, the bigger macro, um, macro <coughs> issues that this solves. When we designed this, we unashamedly designed this for entrepreneurs. Yeah. That's a question. Yeah. Uh, is uh, changing to get minority stake or control over the Okay, so what happens is the individual companies swap 100% of their stock okay, for a multiple of on, on the top, and I'll talk about that later, but they keep full control. Contractually, we can't tell them how to run their business. Uh, and even though, so that they're a, they become uh, an owner of the yeah. holding company, but they can't tell any of the other holding companies how to run their business either. So everyone keeps that independence. 
let me just run through it and then we'll do the Q&A uh, at the end. Um, so for those that come in late, basically I'm going to high level explain the agglomeration model. We'll get into Q&A because I know there's a few people with specific uh, things they want to discuss. Uh, and then I'll talk about the fund that we announced yesterday and how that works and how you potentially uh, benefit from that. So uh, in short, we designed this specifically for entrepreneurs so that they can unlock that, that shareholder value. What's really interesting is this liquidity squeeze in the small business space and, and every entrepreneur, uh, sorry, every angel investor that's in, in the room and, and in this com conference has talked about the, the liquidity problem. It really, really suppresses the value of small businesses. Um, small businesses, depending on the industry and various other things, you're kind of looking at three, four, possibly five times multiple. Occasionally, you'll get a little bit higher uh, than that times times profit. Um, now, I know everyone reads TechCrunch and they know that they don't need revenue to be a billion dollar company, but outside of that weird little Silicon Valley bubble, uh, in the real world where real businesses are, uh, valuations are rubbish in your small business. Um, What's interesting is the minute that you go into a public, a big public company, big public companies in the US right now are averaging 30 times profit. Averaging across, across, the, um, across the whole New York Stock Exchange, 30 times profit. Um, now you can argue that we're in a bit of a bubble, uh, but even so, longer term, it averages around 20 times for a, for a big public company. So really the agglomeration model is about that arbitrage between the value of a small business and a big business. And what's interesting is because you can see that clear transformation from going from uh, a low multiple to a high multiple, it's basically acknowledging that there was value there. Right? As entrepreneurs, we know that we're creating a ton of value. We know that we're worth millions to the economy, um, but we're not seeing any of it because nobody else values it. The reason they don't value it is because it's illiquid and it's risky. When you put it into a portfolio of companies in a PLC, you eliminate the risk and you eliminate the liquidity, and therefore you get a huge valuation bump. And what that's saying is investors recognize there's value in these small businesses, they just haven't previously been able to get involved and support it in an effective way for them. Um, for those of you, who's an angel? Who's got angel investments? Okay. Um, so you will already know how frustrating it is trying to get your money back out of small businesses. Uh, I've uh, also made some stupid investments in my life. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I, I mentioned yesterday, un entrepreneurs will always tell you that they're going to exit in three to five years. Uh, it's kind of a default that we, we set. Uh, it's a useful time frame. Uh, three to five years is close enough and it's quite motivating, but it's far enough away that we don't have to think about it. It's also a really stupid metric. All that's going to happen is you're three years later, you're three years old. A much smarter metric is we're going to sell when we get a $10 million valuation, or we're going to sell when we get to any other metric at time. Um, but this, this model solves a lot of that. For founders, uh, you always get the, the equity value. Um, you solve this procurement issue because you're now bidding as part of a big project. Uh, it's much easier to do international growth when you're, when you're part of this uh, group. The reason is the other founders that are all sitting in different countries have a vested interest in your success. So the way small businesses typically do international expansion, it's very typical for everyone, is you go into the new country, Typically one client has brought you into a new country and said, love what you do, come to this new country and we'll support you. So you go into this new country, but they're not giving you enough money to actually build a team. So you then burn through, two, for two or three years, you burn through capital, trying to get established in this new town. Uh, you typically churn through staff. Uh, as an entrepreneur, you blame the new country. The new country is full of idiots, um, yet you're the one losing the money. Um, and Typically, it takes about two to three years to, to get onto the level playing field. In our model, you've got companies all around the world that have a vested interest in your success. So if you phone them up and say, hey, can I stick a chair in your office, just what we get established, it's in their interest to say yes. 
it's in their interest to introduce you to the right people to support you with their stuff. Um, now, this is really, really important for entrepreneurs. Most of us have spent the last 10, 15, 20 years of our lives doing everything on our own, being responsible. Uh, one of the things that used to really bug me as an entrepreneur was everyone gives you advice. He says, giving advice. Um, everyone gives you advice and no one's got any skin in the game. And it goes in phases, right? So uh, a few years ago, it didn't matter what you did, you had to build an app, right? Everyone goes, oh, you've got, to make, you've got to build an app. Um, it's not their money that they spent on the app. They have no idea how to distribute the app. They haven't thought about it. A bit after that, it was, I've got to be in China. I've got to be in China. If you just get $1 off everyone in China, you can sort of. Um, again, it's not them that has to go through the process of doing that. It gets really frustrating. Uh, the nice thing about this acceleration model is that when you ask your peers for advice, we call it the board you couldn't afford, when you ask them for advice, they're not going to give you flippant advice. Because if you go and spend a chunk of cash, that's ultimately going to affect their, um, the profit of the group. So you get really, really good advice, which is a, a, a nice benefit. Um, you get liquid network. So actually, you, you can actually start to benefit from all of the things that you thought you were going to benefit from as being an entrepreneur. Private wealth banks will start to give you all of the services that you don't normally get as a, as a normal citizen. Uh, Hedge the risk. Most entrepreneurs have their entire wealth tied up in their business and or their, their property. That's it. That's not diversified. When you come into this, your, your wealth is now tied across, it's a, it's a tied across, across multiple companies, multiple countries. And you can start to sell down some of your stock and diversify your wealth. Um, just in terms of peace of mind, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I don't think I'm the only entrepreneur that's made a ton of money and lost it all. And made a ton of money and lost it all. Made a ton of money. Uh, we're not very good at holding on to money. But this kind of gives you uh, a, that sort of peace of mind. And really, it's not peace of mind for me. It's peace of mind for my wife. <laughs> um, remain in complete control. And this is the bit that really freaks out the finance people. It really freaks out uh, private equity and, and uh, investment banks because they hate the idea of entrepreneurs staying in control. Uh, but yeah, but you, you know, if you're going to acquire, you, you've, got to, you've got to tell them how to run their business. Uh, our view is twofold. One is that the best person to, to make decisions in their business is the entrepreneur. They know the heartbeat of their staff, they know when they're overworked, they know when they're ready to take on new projects. They also know their clients better than anyone else. Um, the second point is it's really no point telling an entrepreneur what to do because they're not going to listen to you anyway. And we, we're terrible at taking advice from other people. Um, and we, this is where you get these conflicts. And so typically in a roll-up model, which is, which is fairly well understood, where you bring a bunch of companies together, you overpay for the companies and you try and flush out the synergies. And the idea being that if you consolidate all of the finance functions into one, solve the sales function, you'll make so much more profit or it make sense. But we get back to this idea of having an accountant sitting in a different city or a different country telling an entrepreneur how to run their business. And it just doesn't work. The entrepreneur leaves and in small business, the entrepreneur is the talent in that business of their team. Uh, so keep them in complete control. We have a few reserved matters. Um, so a reserve matter basically means if you want to do something that's completely unusual, you just need to get a majority vote from your other founders. So if you suddenly want to go from being a marketing company to selling ice cream to children, um, you have to, that's a complete change of direction. It's not that you can't do it, but you need to get a majority vote of the, the other founders to so you need to be able to pitch why that makes sense. Um, if you uh, if you want to significantly increase your salary once you've joined the group, again, you put that to the other founders uh, and they will vote. Now, if you've just submitted terrible numbers and you decide you want to double your salary, there's a good chance they're going to vote no. If you've just submitted great numbers and you want to increase your salary, they probably vote yes, because they know that they're going to be doing the same thing at a later point. Actually, the bigger problem we have is we work on a multiple of profit um, and so entrepreneurs keep wanting to do the Steve Jobs thing, paying themselves a, a dollar and taking more profit. Um, so we have to make it market. Rate. 
Um, one of the biggest reasons why companies join us in this model is that they want to retain key staff. Uh, they've built the business up and they know that their staff are at a flight risk um, and they know that giving them private stock uh, is, is valueless exercise and less than excellent. Um, the idea of being able to incentivize with proper stock options and that sort of stuff becomes very, very powerful. We've got this natural mastermind that I talked about uh, and it becomes much, much easier to start acquiring your suppliers and your competitors and other, other players. Um, I thought I'd share with you uh, the values that we run everything by um, because it's not only the values that, that work in our business, uh, it's also the values that work for, for the agglomeration model. Uh, in our own company, we scale with credits quickly. Uh, it's very difficult to keep a culture when, when you scale fast, so we've kind of had to, to think about these things. Um, the first one is trust. And I'll be the first to admit that this has been tested uh, in, in, uh, over time. But we assume best intent, believe best results are achieved through giving control, not taking it. And that's the same for our staff, it's the same for the companies that we work with. Um, we're, we're not naive to the fact that occasionally staff will steal from you. We're not naive to the fact that an entrepreneur could take advantage of this model. Because we give full control to the entrepreneurs that join, <coughs> theoretically, they could join, they could get their shares, and they could run their company into the ground. And contractually, they're allowed to do that. Now, that terrifies lawyers. Um, but the reason we do that is that we're entrepreneurs, and it kind of goes against your DNA to destroy something that you've created. Also, the way that we structure the deal is that they, all the companies come in on three times their last year's EBITDA, and then every year thereafter, they get an additional three times the incremental EBIT. So each year they're in the group and contributing profit, they're earning more and more shares. So there's a very big carrot to keep uh, contributing and performing. Uh, velocity, this is one that kind of causes a, a bit of confusion, but as entrepreneurs, we kind of subscribe to the um, Zuckerberg's move fast and break things. Uh, if you've ever been involved in a private equity deal or an M&A deal, they drag on for months and years, and actually that's part of the strategy, it's just the way down. Um, we believe in moving quickly. Uh, we, apologies to any lawyers in the room, we're uh, not huge fans of, sorry about it. Um, yeah, we're not fans of anyone that gets paid by the hour to do something quickly. It's just a metric that doesn't make any sense to us. But I'm sure you're different. Uh, <laughs> so we believe in moving fast. Uh, this model allows us to move fast. Uh, and, and part of it is you can move fast when you trust people. Um, but also we know that even if we get a deal wrong, if you've got three companies in the group and a deal goes south, that's a real problem. If you've got 30 companies in the group and a deal goes south, it's not the end of the world. And the benefit that you've created by moving quickly far outweighs the downside. Uh, and the third one is collaboration, and, and the message across both of the books that, uh, that I wrote is that I believe we're moving from an era of uh, competition into an era of collaboration. Uh, I think that the, you know, we used to have these big corporations that all competed against each other. We're now splitting into a time where you've got lots and lots of small businesses. The only way these small businesses can compete against the big companies is to collaborate. Um, and I think there's a lot more opportunity. And we talk about moving your chair around to the other side of the table. So when we're having a conversation with entrepreneurs, when we're doing due diligence, for example, normally due diligence is a really invasive process for entrepreneurs. It's the you know, opening your kimono, and then you've got some 28-year-old MBA from Anderson, whatever they call it, KPG, who will come in and laugh at you and say, well, why have you done your business like that? Um, we take it the other way, because it's not going to affect the valuation. Normally, due, due diligence is used to, point, to score points. It's not going to affect the valuation with us. So we sit on your side of the table and say, that we know every business is a little bit shit. Just show us where the shit bits are, and we'll figure it out, because we want this to be successful as well. Uh, and it's a very different way of, of doing it. It's a very collaborative way. Um, and then collaboration within the group. 
Uh, when you look at our group of companies, there are so many opportunities, there are so many synergies. Now the thing with synergies, they look great on paper, they very rarely work uh, in reality. But the one way you can guarantee a partnership will fail, or a synergy will fail, is if you put pressure on it. It just doesn't work. Um, so where you've got these uh, an accountant sitting at the top saying, you two need to work with each other, um, both of you will end up presenting me for, for that. When you put a room of entrepreneurs, sorry, if you put a bunch of entrepreneurs in a room together and they've all got a vested interest in working together, they love finding synergies and working together. Uh, but they now own it. And they've always got the opportunity to say, no, I don't want to do it all. No, my company's uh, not right for that right now. Um, we learned uh, some important lessons about that. You, you put 20 entrepreneurs in a room with a bunch of whiteboards and, and ask them to find ways to work together. It is the happiest day of their, their lives. They will scribble stuff, they will figure out world peace, they'll do everything, they absolutely love it. Being entrepreneurs, they then all go out for drinks, so nobody's written any notes down, and nothing happens. Um, so what we learned is that you have to have a grown-up in the room that is actually taking notes and uh, will hold them to it. Uh, what we also realized was it's actually much more effective to get the salespeople in the room together because they're the ones that are actually incentivized to cross-sell and do stuff and get the operation people in the room together because they're the ones that are incentivized to find savings. Um, but this is what you learn as you go through it. Um, it's a bit of a mind shift for, uh, for entrepreneurs that come into this. It was a huge mind shift for myself uh, when I went from a small business to a, a public business. Um, there's a few things you need to be very conscious of. As entrepreneurs, when someone asks us how the business is going, we always say it's fantastic. This year is always our best year ever. Um, next, next month we're about to seal this incredible deal. It's fantastic. Uh, you can do that when you're a private company. In fact, you don't have to do that as a private company. If you do it as a public company, you get done for insider trading. Um, so it's a bit of a culture shock to uh, start to be conscious of, of those sort of things. Uh, the other thing which is really disconcerting as a, as a business owner when you go public is that your net worth changes every day and you can see it um, and you have a very big conflict between your value system and the value of financial traders so entrepreneurs create value in the world that's how we that's how we do what we do uh, most of the value, most of the decisions we make are about how we create more value for more people and often we don't know the results of that decision for months or years. Uh, so you're in this place where you're making these long-term value decisions, suddenly you go into a public world where someone will trade your stock 12 times in a day and not care at all about the value that's going on in your uh, day job. Um, what happens is your stock can suddenly drop 20% in a day, or it can go up 20% in a day, and you're sitting there going, I'm wearing blue socks. Is it because I'm not? I'm always going to wear blue socks. And it, there is such a disconnect between what's going on. Um, so, so literally, we have to kind of train people to not be checking their share price every day. Um, well, I fail this way of doing that. So, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, but it, it's a very big. Uh, very big shift in thinking. I think the other big shift in thinking for me was when you're an entrepreneur in a small business, a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. If you make a dollar off someone, that's a dollar that you can then spend and you spend that dollar. When you get into a public company and you're trading at 20 times profit, that dollar is now worth $20. That's a really big mind shift. And uh, suddenly you start looking at your staff's requests for expenses in, in a very different light. Well, that $100,000 contract that you can win, but it's going to involve flying to a country you don't really want to go to, well, 100 times 20 actually is worth you flying to that country to do that contract. So it's a, it's a big shift in thinking. Um, you do need to get a little bit more professional to be part of a group like this, uh, but typically by the time you've got to, we, we typically work with companies that are half a million, we're now sort of drawing a line at a million dollars in profit. By the time you're at a million in profit, you've normally got a pretty competent CFO that's, that's working with you. 
Um, initially, when we did this, we worked with smaller companies. We had quite a few problems with companies that just had no idea what their what their numbers were and couldn't pull numbers together each month. But we sort of got over that. Um, obviously, Unity is very to try and keep the uh, as much of the market stuff away from the founders and their team so that they can actually just get on with doing doing some day-to-day -day business. The typical IPO process for a small business, there's no wonder why IPO numbers are, are dropping. Um, Merrill Lynch in their promotional material for doing an IPO with them says the average IPO takes 18 months, will cost you $3.6 million and will take your full management team for the last 12 months of that process. And somehow you're supposed to run a business at the same time. Um, so in our case, Unity Group will do a lot of that stuff for the company so they can just get on uh, and deal with their clients. Um, I'm not going to drill into too much detail. I'll come back to these if questions are around them. Um, a couple of people were asking me yesterday about how we choose markets. Um, but like when I do my own slides, I have one picture and one word. When the geeks in, in uh, due diligence do my slides, so they're, they're uh, very different. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons why we, check, we choose particular markets. Um, what we found is that most small businesses now have quite a global outlook on life. We tend to have global customers, global investors, global uh, customers and uh, suppliers. Yet when you think about listing, you always tend to think about your local market. Um, well, that kind of doesn't make a lot of sense because different markets have different valuations for different sectors. Different markets have better liquidity than the other markets. So we, we, we're able to take a very global and holistic approach and we will go to markets that serve us as best. Uh, everyone memorize that? Good. Got that? Uh, all right, we'll come back to this if there's uh, questions on it. Um, a couple of things about what makes public stock successful and then I'm going to share with you the case study of the first one of these we did. Um, so public, public stocks, uh, they're no different from uh, anything else. You have to have uh, buyers. Right? If you're going to get the value up, you've got to have buyers. And, and the stock itself, the, the market cap, is not a reflection of the value of your business. It's a reflection of the number of buyers and sellers in the market you can stop. Uh, scale and liquidity equal value. The bigger you are, the more valuable you become. Um, everyone's been talking about liquidity. Uh, what was interesting in the ICO presentations yesterday was they said the great thing about ICOs is that it's lots of liquidity. Um, there's only liquidity if you can find someone to buy those coins off you. Uh, if you can't find buyers, there is no liquidity. So, for example, certain markets, uh, like we've never listed in Singapore, our home market, um, ASX in Australia, uh, some of these markets are very, very illiquid for small companies. So what happens is companies will list on them and then no one trades their shares. And if you find yourself in that situation, you're basically paying fees to be on there and you've got none of the advantages. Uh, diversification of products, service and value. Fundamentally, if, if a founder is swapping their private stock for public stock, our responsibility is to protect the value of that private stock and then ultimately grow it faster than they'd be able to grow on their own. One of the ways we protect it is diversification. So, uh, geographic diversification. Um, I don't know if you've been watching, but countries are doing some very silly things at the moment. I don't want my financial wealth tied up in any one country. I want to diversify it. Uh, and also sector uh, diversification because sectors go up and down. Uh, uh, diversification of skill and personal influence uh, is kind of an interesting one as well. Uh, the nice thing about our model is no one shareholder control has a controlling stake. We've got lots of minority shareholders. Um, we don't have, you know, if, if the when Steve Jobs died, it was a really big deal for Apple. But in a group of companies. Uh, it, it has very little impact if, if I don't know if the founders died, but if, you know, the, the hit by a bus test it, it passes. 
Time. All right, good. Um, I'm going to take some Q and A on the agglomeration model, uh, and then what I'll do is go into the fund that we talked about yesterday and, and how that works and and uh, ties into this. Yes. So a couple of questions. One: How do you make your? How, how does Unity make money? So are you going to be part of this whole? Structure as well. Do you own shares of the holding company, or do you charge a fee or service fee? Okay. And second of all, if, if, if is is uh, is Unity Group one group? So if you find another company which you think is good to add to this edition, it kind of rides on this vehicle, or uh, you you say you know what each year I'm going to create a new vehicle. So if you come in January, you got to wait until September. Okay. Um, so the first thing is we don't make money; we're a charity. <laughs> so the, the way that Unity Group makes money is we create the vehicle, we underwrite the cost of putting all this listing together, and we typically end up with about 15 to 20% of the public company. Uh, we're locked in as well, so we're, we're very long-term greedy on this, and, and our values are very much aligned with the founders. Uh, but actually, we're not looking, we don't control it. We're, we're still, uh, the founders still make up the majority of the group. So we will be on the board for the first year, um, but if we don't do a good job in terms of value creation, the founders can vote us off and vote whoever they want off. We're not looking to control stuff. This was literally designed by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. We don't want to be running companies. Um, let me, before I get into the, the, the second part of the question, let me give you the case study of, of what went right and what went wrong the first time we, we did this model. So uh, we had the idea. Um, obviously, uh, obviously, when you come up with an idea like this, uh, you have to go and try and pitch it and, and turn it into reality. Uh, the initial pitch was going up to our mates who own businesses and said, give us 100% of your company and we'll promise we'll give you public stock later and it'll be great. Didn't work so well, had to kind of twist and refine the pitch a little bit. Um, but we, we got lucky enough that we found four people that, that trusted us. Um, actually, the way we did it was we completely de-risked it for them. We realized the only way we could do this was to completely de-risk it. So we had contracts signed with them, but they all had side letters that said uh, if we miss certain target dates or if they change their mind or if we get a better offer from someone else or if they don't like one of the other founders, uh, that they can, walk, they can rip the contract up and walk away. And we genuinely meant it because they, this has to be something that, that they want to be a part of. Uh, we started it, uh, long story short, we thought we could do it in six months um, because we're media entrepreneurs. Um, ended up taking uh, about 11 months in all until we, we got listed, uh, which still everyone kind of said, how did you do it in 11 months? Um, for us, it was really painfully slow, but we got listed. We listed on the European NASDAQ, which is the most liquid small market in, uh, in, in the world. Um, we, so we, we brought the whole crew over to Stockholm. We rang the bell. We broke the bell. The bell is 140 years old. We broke it. We were quite excited. There was a lot of pent up aggression there. Um, we, we're drinking champagne, the clock is counting down, it's about to, about to list. Uh, we've got the head of the European NASDAQ is there. Um, and he's looking at something on the, the digital board. And, and what happens is the market opens and the market tries to find the price before it announces it. And so the market opens and there's no, no ticker appearing and no ticker appearing. And the head of the NASDAQ is looking at it and I suddenly see him like literally turn green and run out of the room. I'm like, what's going on? Um, and he came back in about 10 minutes later and he said, I'm sorry, I had to cancel it. Uh, uh, and they had listed us in the wrong currency. And when you're NASDAQ, you don't mess around with your computer system when the system's live. So we had spent <laughs> nine months and we had investors behind us and we had kind of hyped everyone up that we were going to get live. We'd and the whole team over there, uh, and suddenly, like, we, we couldn't even list. Um, so we decided to go out and celebrate anyway. And the next day, when we listed in the right currency, uh, we all had really sore heads. But the, um, 
the share price went up 23% on day one. Uh, I got a, <laughs> an email from someone saying it's fantastic, it's the best return I've ever had, it's sold out. Um, two months later, it was up 900%. <coughs> so basically what happened, we started with four companies. Uh, three weeks later, we announced our first acquisition of two more companies. Uh, about four weeks after that, we announced three more companies to join. At the end of two months, we had 13 companies in the group, and we'd gone from 1.4 million in EBIT up to about 9 million in EBIT, and the share price had just gone through the roof. Um, if you saw the video uh, that Baylor's played yesterday, there's um, a moment where myself and Jeremy are in Times Square. We got invited by NASDAQ to apologize. For, it's the first time they've ever got a currency wrong. Um, so they, we, we flew to, to New York. Um, they put on in Times Square, five stories up. It said NASDAQ welcomes Callum Lane on June 16th. Oh, how cool is that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. I have this one question. <coughs> Why did you choose the name Yeah. And they will always be listed in the stock market of Europe. No, I'm getting, getting on that. Um, but so there are two more questions. Let me, let me finish this case study and then, then we'll get to the questions. Um, so we got to a situation where our life went completely bonkers uh, because the value of the company had now reached nearly 300 million. We, we listed at 14 million euros, we're now 300 million in, in a couple of months. Um, we were being bombarded by companies that wanted to join us, um, and big companies, companies that had five, ten million million that wanted to join us. Uh, the problem with the bigger companies is that you can't just do a 100% share swap with these guys. They've always got minority shareholders that want to get out, they've always got debt that needs to be cleared before they come in, there's always a reason to need cash. So we had this bizarre situation where we're a $300 million company, banks won't lend you money. Even when you're a $300 million company, in your first year of being a public listed company, you have to have done one year of results before you'll get that. However, financial institutions love to lend you money, and they lend it against your stock. Uh, so we suddenly had all of these uh, financial institutions reaching out to us saying, hey, we'll give you cash, and we'll hold your stock. Um, we did a deal with a company in America that had been recommended to us. We lodged 3 million shares with them. They were supposed to give us about 9 million euros, which would have allowed us to complete a whole bunch more um, deals. Unfortunately, it was a rogue company. Uh, we've done our due diligence. The, the guy that owned the company uh, basically went back. He'd never been bad before, but he ripped off us and three other, uh, two other companies at the same time. A Hong Kong company and an Australian company. The, um, Stop that the shares that we thought were in a locked up account was actually owned by his friend, and this guy basically stole those three million shares and dumped them on the stock market. Uh, now, when you're a small company and somebody floods the market with three million shares, you just have unrelenting sell side. Um, and so, what happened was we were on this beautiful, crazy curve up, and admittedly, we were silly and overvalued. Uh, but we now have this unrelated sell side. The share price dropped from nine euros to three euros. Um, and a couple of the deals that we had done at around seven euros decided they didn't want to play anymore. So we announced to the market we did these deals. We didn't want to, like contractually, we could have held them to it, but this is, this is designed to help entrepreneurs not to take them through court. So we unwound those deals, uh, which obviously the market suddenly got very jittery about. Um, so, what was really interesting about that whole process, and ultimately what we did, we brought in a new board to reassure the market, and, and it's kind of slowly building its way back up. We learned a huge amount going through that process. It put massive, massive pressure on the model. You imagine founders that had come in and seen their wealth uh, uh, soar and then suddenly plummet again. Um, it created a lot of tension, but what it did was it allowed us to refine the model. Um, and as much as I never want to go through that process again, uh, irritatingly, I know at some point I'll look back and go, oh, that's the best thing that ever happened. But, um, because we, we learned a lot about how, how to structure it moving forward. Uh, a couple of things that we kind of learned, obviously you, you um, don't use, uh, or you, you do your own escrow account so that nobody else can, can ever uh, take advantage. We would never lodge that many shares with anyone 
account, uh, again, we've also got, uh, we now do much, much better financing. So we've got companies that will back us before we go into uh, deals like this so that we can continue to grow. Um, other than that, it was kind of minor things, but it was uh, one of the things we learned as well. We don't want to be in one sector, we want to be in diverse, uh, diverse sectors, uh, like Berkshire Hathaway. Um, but it was, uh, it was a very, very good learning ultimately. And, and so the next ones that we do, and so to answer your question, Mohammed, uh, we will create new publicly listed vehicles. Uh, so we've got one right now which we're filling up with, with companies. Um, what we'll probably do is start new ones because certain companies want to join at an early stage, other companies don't want to join until we've already reached a billion market cap. Um, but for us, starting the businesses is the hardest bit, starting the PLCs, that's the, the least fun. Um, the value creation comes once you've got these listed vehicles and you can start to really grow and help the company get them to scale. Yeah, good. One more question. Yeah, the group, uh, please, 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 You've got everyone else around the table has a vested interest in helping them. So oftentimes with a small business, you lose one key client, it can really hammer your profitability for a year. Um, and normally you're trying to figure everything out on your own. Right? You've got staff, you're now over staff, you don't lose We've got other people in the room that could potentially borrow your staff for a few months until you get back into the things, maybe share an office with them until you get back into the so it's a much more supportive environment. Um, we wouldn't pick a company out. The other thing is companies get incentivized for overperforming and they get punished for underperforming because we know that that company can come back. Um, so theoretically, um, a company could, uh, we would have situations with the first group where we unwound the transaction, they get shares, we get back the company. Uh, we can do that, but it's kind of like a master. Thank you. 
I get construction to poison. So, so we actually we didn't structure it because when we looked at it, trying to do a poison pill across 20 different countries is really difficult. Um, and we knew that we would have three or four years sort of warning that this was coming. Uh, so if it looks like that will come. But the, the principle of the the whole model was to help entrepreneurs learn to value their businesses if you control. So that's really important. If we ever saw that there was a threat to that, then we would find a way to to find it. So you have thought of this beforehand that if someone comes and yeah, yeah, yeah. so you keep adding companies uh, so you, you basically look as we discussed yesterday, Berkshire Hathaway is model I mean, yeah. made it into medium sized or small or medium sized company. Yeah. So you're constantly, you're constantly adding stock, which means that so one of, one of the concerns is well, I'm being diluted, I'm getting my percentage to get smaller and smaller. But you can your earnings per share is going up because we're acquiring companies at three or four times multiple, we're trading at 15, 20 times. So it's, 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 things that you get smaller, you're so, so actually, it's not about the value of your company going into the company. It's the value of the next company, the next company, the next company. And since everyone's on the same level playing field, it's very good. Let me just, um, yes, sorry. Um, for how many years does the company have to be in business before and facilitate the business? Yeah, I mean, our criteria is a million in profit. Um, so theoretically, if they got to that, first year, we would look at it. Um, markets tend to get a little bit funny with young companies, so generally we have, as a, as a rule of thumb, we say three years or more. Um, uh, but yeah, so we're doing it profit. Let me just talk about uh, what we announced yesterday, because this is, um, this to me is kind of the, the, the next level up on this, it's kind of like a conglomeration on steroids, is, is what you can kind of do with this. We, when we had TMG and we were at the height of that, we did lots of media coverage, we had something like a thousand companies approach us saying they want to be a, a part of um, there's, a, there's a huge demand of companies that, that want to keep control, that want to put it in the and all of those things. A lot of those companies still want money. Right? They, they want investment capital. So they might be doing two, three million in profit, but they're looking for cash. Um, and our view was always, well, our model wasn't really designed for that. It was designed to give you scale of liquidity. And once we're part of a big company, it's much easier to get cash as a billion dollar company than it is as a $5 million dollar company. Um, but what it occurred to us uh, about uh, six months ago or so was we can set up a venture capital arm um, off to the side. This is a, an independent venture capital fund. We've got a third party um, treasurer. That, that but the venture capital fund's thesis, if you will, is they only invest in companies that have agreed to be agglomerated. Um, now, that gets really, really interesting because basically what happens is this, and, and we've, we've got a hundred million dollar fund, we've just announced that we're raising 200 million with WPAF. Um, we take that 200 million, we invest it into a small business. So if you've got a company that's doing a million in profit, we will invest up to five million into that company. The company then gets acquired, swaps their private stock for public stock for three times uh, even plus whatever's on the balance sheet. So if they've got nothing else in the, in the bank balance, it would be for eight million in the stock. The venture capital arm gets five million and the founder gets three million. This is huge for the small business because now you've got all of the advantages of being a public company, but you can start, you've got a big pool of cash to go out and start hiring people and doing all the things that, that you, be, uh, you want to do. Uh, obviously, we don't give it to you all in a bag on day one and say, no, oh, it's going to have fun. Uh, you, you sit with us and you work out criteria. Okay, I'm going to pick these KPIs and release this much and so forth. But the money sits on the balance sheet of the PLC. What that means is the PLC announces to the market, All right, we'll just acquire a million dollars of EBIT and five million dollars of net cash, and it's cost us eight million in stock. Uh, there, there is no other PLC in the world that can announce deals of that value. Buying cash that cheap is, is just unheard of. Um, I think it's really interesting for the venture capital arm, because the venture capital arm invested in a private, illiquid, small business in the morning, 
in the afternoon, they've got completely liquid shares. Uh, and the venture capital arm is unlocked. So the venture capital arm can now start to sell down. So if the share price jumps 10, 15 percent on day one, which is it's very doable when you announce an acquisition like that, the, the venture capital arm can sell down 10 percent of its, its stock and take that profit. And then over the course of the next year, it just keeps selling down from that. The minute it's sold down that money, uh, those shares, it can inject that capital into the next company. So whereas a venture capital firm, a traditional venture capital firm, will use the dollar once, and they're sticking it to a company and then praying for an exit for 14 years, uh, we can use your dollar over and over and over and over again to support small businesses, which means we can fund so many more small businesses. They get the cash to grow, they get the scale, um, and this is just, it's such a game changer because for us, well, the rest of the world is obsessed with tech startups and 18 year olds inventing flappy bird apps and that sort of stuff. If we can find um, a restaurant chain and grow it from 5 million in revenue to 50 million in revenue, which is very doable with this structure, uh, that's going to add hundreds of, of jobs to the economy. Um, if you then replicate that 20, 30, Uh, every quarter I run a day and a half workshop in 
much easier to work with something that we have got and just refer to the things and that stuff. Uh, and then if you decide that that's something that you want to start building on your own, it's quite cool to build it directly as a group. Um, we I would really love to support you because our view is that if you've got thousands of PLCs where small businesses have a home, it basically gives you um, as a founder of a business, you can start the business with the view that, okay, I just need to get to a million in profit and then I can get on this escalator and take me up to the, the next level. As opposed to get to a million and now we get to the next level and uh, going through the hardest part of what you can actually do. Um, so, yeah, we uh, might have been to a few of these. He uh, still quietly laughs at my jokes, even though he's having a few times. <laughs> Thank you. 